away from the elephants. Um, very, very little um, in my professional life gives me as much pleasure as when um, somebody who's joined us for a little while um, and Lydia didn't work for us. She was one of the first batch of research assistants for Think Elephants International with Dr. Josh. But when they come to us relatively early in their career um, and then go on to great things. Lydia had worked with elephants before she came. She'd worked in Nepal um, working on human elephant conflict and alternative cropping there, I seem to remember. Um, and then she came and spent, <laughs> spent some time with us um, uh, working, as I say, as a research assistant for Think Elephants International when we had full-time research going on on site. Um, and then went on to great things. And we, we were very, very happy to when she uh, went, got her, was working in the Maasai Mara for a while when I went to Kenya, living on top of the mountains and looking down. Um, and then is now making me uh, extremely jealous um, and in a, in a wonderful place working for a fantastic organization doing, as I say, very, very great things, which she will tell us more about. She's currently based, well, the job is based in Sabo. She's actually beaming in from Samburu in Kenya. Um, and she's working for, on human elephant conflict for uh, Save the Elephants, which is, for those of you who don't know it, perhaps... There are a few um, elephant research organizations, but I would say it's the preeminent elephant research organization, certainly in, in northern Kenya, um, mm -hmm. and also obviously working in Savo, so, uh, so in, in the south a little bit as well. And learning and helping Lydia's job is to mitigate human elephant conflict and to measure human elephant conflict and help elephants and humans live together. Now, I've personally been to, I haven't been to Samburu to this headquarters, but I have been in the area and it always amazes me how humans and elephants do live together and do share a landscape up there. Um, but obviously there is conflict and there are places, there, there are areas where elephants get hurt and humans get hurt. Um, and Save the Elephants and Lydia put a lot of work into mitigating that and making sure that the, uh, the ride is as smooth as possible for, for both species. So without further ado, I will hand you across to Lydia um, and uh, say hello Lydia, tell us all about it. Thanks so much, John. I'm just going to share my screen right now. Uh, bring the presentation up. So yeah, thank you, John, and for the introduction. It was a, a very lovely introduction, and thanks so much for inviting me to talk to you today. I'm really thrilled to be talking to you about some of the work that Save the Elephants do in Kenya, and specifically I'm going to be talking about some work in Savo where we're trying to find different tools uh, in which to mitigate conflict and ensure a peaceful coexistence between humans and elephants. So I've been working for Save the Elephants now for about three years. So I help manage the elephant tracking program and involved in uh, the HEC program. So as John said, my journey working with elephants started in Nepal where I carried out my master's project. I then worked, uh, as John said, for Think Elephants International uh, in 2012. And so my time here with John and everyone was really a very special time. And I really continue to follow and admire the work of these two organizations. And I feel that it's got me to where I am today. So thanks to everyone at GTAF and Think Elephants International. So yeah, after Thailand, I moved to another continent, to Kenya, to study human-elephant conflict in the Maasai Mara, a place called the Transmara. And then I stayed, stayed in Kenya and started working with Save the Elephants. So Save the Elephants is a research and conservation organisation and was founded in 1993 by Dr Ian Douglas Hamilton. So there's four pillars of the organization. The first is research, which is probably at the heart of everything that we do. So we try and understand elephant behavior, elephant uh, movement and intelligence by using sort of cutting edge scientific technology. The second is protection. So along with the Wildlife Conservation Network, we set up the Elephant Crisis Fund, and this was in response to the poaching crisis. So this is emergency funding for anti-poaching projects, demand reduction projects, and, uh, um, and other projects. And so we've funded over 290 projects over 38 countries, and it's roughly about $2 million a year that we've funded. 
So the third pillar is awareness. So we have a big education program in Sambu and Savo. And part of this uh, program is a scholarship program. So we fund elephant ambassadors through either school or their university. And finally, there's the fourth pillar, which is the human elephant coexistence program. And this is probably one of the most complex and uh, challenging pillars out of all of uh, the four pillars and I'm going to talk to you about this project today just to give you a bit of an overview about some of the things um, that we're going to that we do. So I'm now going to take you over to our main human elephant conflict site which is in a place called Savo in Kenya. So Savo lies in the southeast of Kenya and is about 42,000 kilometers squared so that's about the size of Denmark so a really huge ecosystem that we're dealing with. Savo is a wilderness area with breathtaking landscapes and really incredible biodiversity. So take note of the colour of the soil as one way that we can identify Savo elephants is by looking at the colour of their skin, which is a slight orange tone due to the iron-rich soils in Savo. And Savo is also home to some of the last remaining great tuskers. So great tuskers are magnificent creatures. Their tusks literally touch the ground and the elephant looking at you right now is probably Kenya's most iconic and famous great tusker. He was called Sachao and he was born in the late 1960s. Tragically, he was killed when he was about 45 years of age. But each of his tusks weighed over 50 kgs each, which is about 100 pounds, and were over two, two meters in length. So these are really incredible uh, animals and Savo is lucky to have some of these remaining individuals. So Savo also boasts Kenya's single largest population of elephants. In the last census that we carried out in 2017, we counted about 13,000 individuals. So this might sound like a lot of elephants, especially to the numbers there in Asia, but it's not when you consider the huge numbers that used to exist like scenes like this. This was taken in 1938, where there are approximately 45,000 elephants. So the reason for these dramatic declines uh, was the poaching crisis, which really rapidly wiped out a lot of these elephants. However, the good news today is that populations are recovering and poaching is no longer the biggest threat to elephants. And this is due to the combined effort of wildlife authorities and different organizations. Elephants are now faced with other challenges though, where often elephants uh, migrating through communities get stuck there trying to find food and water. So what you're looking at now is a place called Sagala, which is in, uh, which is in Savo, and this is where our research camp is based. And on the bottom of your screen, our circle in red, is a herd of elephants. And less than 100 metres away uh, is an unfenced farm and, uh, and a house. So as the human population increases, more and more habitat is being lost and fragmented. So this increase in demand for space and resources leads to more competition between people and elephants. I mean, it's a really huge challenge to tackle. How do you keep these seven ton animals out of your community or your farm? And often the people who are impacted are living on the edge of poverty already. So elephants can really impact their livelihoods in a few hours. And this can lead to anger and resentment towards the elephants and sometimes lead to retaliatory killing. So in the photo that you're looking at, the elephants literally turned this man's house upside down. And we see and hear of instances like this all the time. And also instances like this where an elephant's destroyed a farmer's field of crops in just a few hours. And these types of instances are increasing and this is reducing the tolerance that communities once had for elephants. Over the last few years, Savo has, become, has received national newspaper coverage as human-elephant conflict is becoming an increasing problem. Last year, there was even a huge protest in a place called Voy Town, which is near our research camp, and this was over the elephants. So not only do elephants have to navigate through a maze of farmlands, but they have to comprehend crossing infrastructures such as the one in the photo you're looking at. So on the, uh, on the right, get it right, left or right, the right is the busy Mombasa highway. So um, 
this is constantly filled with cars and trucks. So if the elephants manage to cross this road, then they have to find wildlife underpasses to then cross the railway, which is on the left of your screen. And this railway um, is newly built and it literally cuts through Savo East and Savo West National Park. And there's actually more infrastructure being planned, such as the six lane express highway. So as you can see here, there are wildlife underpasses that allow elephants and other wildlife to cross underneath the railway. However, they're not the perfect solution as only six underpasses were installed along the 134 kilometer stretch which goes through the parks. And from collaring elephants, we're seeing that due to the lack of underpasses, the elephants aren't able to get over into the national parks. So they're staying in the, uh, the, in the community areas for a lot longer. And so now we're seeing an increase in human elephant conflict. So we're living in an increasingly human dominated landscape. So we really must come up with long term sustainable solutions to enable people and wildlife to be able to share space and to coexist. And the conservation of elephants will largely depend on how people feel and think about elephants. And this quote was made by Ian Douglas Hamilton, the founder of Save the Elephants. And this is so important in order to tackle any of the challenges facing elephants today. I mean, you and I, we love elephants, but if we don't understand the feelings of the people who actually live alongside elephants, whose daily reality are these crop raiding or property damaging elephants, then any interventions that we may make will fail. So this is um, the conflict to coexistence continuum, and it's a really helpful way of visualizing a range of different human wildlife interactions. So at one end of the spectrum on the left, I've got it right this time, is conflict. And this is where there are high levels of intolerance, negative attitudes towards wildlife. And in these cases, often it can, uh, there can be retaliatory, retributive killing of, of wildlife and often a lack of uptake of conservation interventions. And then you have more neutral mixed feelings in the middle of the continuum. And then at the other end uh, on the right is coexistence. So this is where people have positive attitudes towards uh, wildlife and they fully integrate wildlife uh, into their, wild, into their um, daily lives. And this is the end of the spectrum or end of the continuum that our project is striving to reach to this full coexistence between elephants and people. And to get to this coexistence end of the continuum, we're using a toolbox of different methods. So for example, we're using farm-based deterrents to try and stop elephants from crop raiding. We're trying to change um, farmers' behavior. We're educating um, school children and we're collaring elephants to understand more about crop raiding. So I'm now gonna to talk to you a bit about some of the different interventions that we're uh, trialing and testing um, and, and also a little bit about collaring and how that uh, can be effective in HEC mitigation and for understanding. So part of the toolbox is Save the Elephants flagship project, which is the, uh, the beehive fence. So uh, rural pastoralists in northern uh, Kenya um, said that elephants would avoid feeding on trees that had beehives in them. So Dr. Lucy King, who heads the Human Elephant Coexistence Programme for Save the Elephants, wanted to test this notion for her PhD. So she went to Samburu, where I am at the moment, and played the sound of aggressive bees and uh, recorded how elephants responded to that sound of bees. So she also compared it to white noise. So you have white noise and then see how the elephants react to that and then the sound of aggressive bees. And it was quite dramatic results. So um, elephants moved greater distances when they heard the sound of aggressive bees. Uh, they, had, they exhibited more head shaking in response to bees. So the elephants do that head shake uh, in response to threat. And then they also increased their vocalizations. Uh, more often than uh, to the white noise. And elephants will vocalize when they're in response to a threat as well, so they're communicating with the, the rest of the herd members. So with this knowledge of um, how elephants react to the sound of noisy bees, this is when the concept of the beehive fence was developed. 
So the idea is that you surround a field of crops, so about one to two acres, and you surround it with beehive fences. So it's a very simple design. So you have, you hang the beehives on posts, and then you hang it with wire, and they're connected to other beehives. So you're surrounding the fence, the field with beehives, and they're all connected to each other with this wire. So if an elephant approaches, knocks into the wire, it will shake the beehives, and then the bees get aggressive and will swarm out and then the elephants um, run away. So we've found that about 80% of attempted crop raids have been deterred by the beehive fences. So in our study site in Sagala, they appear to be very effective and we are working with many farmers in this area with the beehive fences. And not only does it stop elephants from entering your farm, but you also produce honey. And this is additional income for the farmers. And it's also very, is there also a healthy uh, alternative to sugar for the farmers as well. So beehive fence is just one of the tools for mitigating conflict, but we're also trialing out different deterrents, such as the smelly elephant repellent. So this idea was developed in Uganda by Wild Aid and the Ugandan Conservation Foundation. And what you do, you mix uh, so rotten eggs, ginger, chili, garlic, uh, cow or elephant dung and so you grind it all up and then you mix it with water and then for about two weeks you leave this mixture in these big containers to brew and obviously in hot climates the egg gets really smelly and all of it just mixed together it's it's yeah it smells really terrible I've uh, worked with this substance it's horrible but anyway so when it's ready you then hang it in bottles um, around your farm uh, so you can see in the picture with the bottles and then you punch some holes in the bottles so that lets out um, the smell. So in Uganda they've been trialling it with about 30 farmers and it appears to be very successful so far uh, and we've tried it with about 10 farmers in Savo and we've seen that elephants walk up to the fence and then they walk away when they get to the, to the fence. And we know that elephants really have an incredible sense of smell so if this uh, repellent smells quite bad for us it must be even worse or elephants. So we're also um, putting up watchtowers in the community that we work with. I know this is quite a common method um, used in Asia, but in, in Kenya especially it's not so common. And so we're seeing how uh, communities react to the watchtowers and so far it's been quite a successful trial. So they're working together in their little units in the community and they're taking it turns to watch out over the farmlands. So when an elephant is approaching, then they can um, warn the other farmers in the area. So it's a good early morning detection system. And also during the peak of the crop raiding season, the rangers will sit up in the watchtowers and then they can see when the elephant is approaching and then work out a way to chase the elephants away. <clears throat> so we're also trying to promote the use of sustainable and drought resistant crops, which are unpalatable to wildlife. So for example, sunflower and chili. So these are crops that we know elephants don't like to eat and other wildlife either. And so currently we're working with over a hundred farmers in the area and they're, um, farm and they're growing sunflowers on a proportion of their field. And so far it seems quite successful as well. So we've got a, a buyer in Nairobi who buys the sunflower seeds from the farmers. And uh, since we've been training, South elephants haven't try to uh, eat the sunflowers, which is great. And this is trying to shift the behavior from farmers to just growing maize and beans, which are crops that elephants love, it's like candy for them, to growing these alternative crops, which also make uh, just as much income, if not more. And we're also trying to test out different ways in which you can grow nutritious crops without having to convert acres and acres of land. So here you can see on the right, there's a simple shade net system, which really helps vegetables grow. And then in the middle, there's a sack. And then in the, on the left is a tire. And these are really cheap materials that the community can source very easily. And you can condense uh, farming the vegetables. So you can have a lot more uh, spinach, which is in the, in the middle in the sack uh, for less space. And these materials all also help filtrate water more efficiently. So this is really useful in Savo where it's very prone to drought. So having these better water filtration systems is also very handy. 
And we also have um, a demo plot at our research center so farmers come and learn about these different techniques. These women, they live daily with the challenges of elephants, but they're now diversifying um, and not only becoming beekeepers, but expert basket weavers using sisal, which is a, a crop grown in, in Savo. So our project supports these women and develop these alternative sources of income. And so most recently, we just finished building a women's enterprise center. So this is a space where women can come and weave their baskets and also uh, produce other um, products that can uh, generate income, uh, which is instead of farming those maize and beans. And for example, just recently in the response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the ladies made um, about 700 masks and they sold them across the community. So it was a great um, other source of income for these ladies. And we also believe that environmental education is one of the most effective tools in conservation. Many children growing up in Savo have not had the chance to mark elephants in the wild. I mean, they live just two kilometers from the national park and they've never been into the park or to see elephants uh, in the park. And so they just associate elephants with fears. They've only seen them crop raiding or damaging their property. So we try and change that perspective by taking children on safari so that they can view the elephants in their natural habitat. And this changes the way the children view elephants as well, as they see that elephants are just similar to humans. They, they live in family groups, they're mothers, they're sisters and brothers. And so if children see elephants in this way, then they can start to understand the importance of elephants and the importance of coexistence. And these children, <clears throat> they are the next generation of future leaders. So the elephants, the future of elephants really lay in their hands. So another tool that we use to try and mitigate and understand more about conflict is collaring elephants and specifically in Savo we've been collaring uh, known crop raiding elephants. So the photo that you're looking at uh, on your screen it's uh, during one of the collaring operations so it's a big team that's needed there's vets, capture rangers, drivers, elephant researchers uh, and so here we're fitting the, the collar to one of the Savo elephants. And so by tracking elephants using satellite collars, we can start to understand the different challenges facing elephants. We can understand the behavior of these crop raiding elephants. And we can also understand different areas that are impacted by elephants. And so every hour, the collar on the elephant transmits to a satellite in the atmosphere, and then this feeds into our central database. And within the database, we have these really sophisticated algorithms that pick up different patterns in the movement data. So for example, if an elephant stops moving for more than five hours, we get sent an immobility alert. So we can go and check on the location of that elephant and see if it's okay. Sometimes an elephant's just been sat under the tree or stood under a tree for about five hours not moving, uh, but some other occasions um, the elephant's been poached or has died. We also have geofences, so this is when uh, an elephant crosses a virtual line, we can get and then also we have movement algorithms. So if an elephant moves faster than it usually does, then we get an alert. So I'll tell you a bit more about the movement and the geofence um, alerts uh, just in a minute. And so we can monitor the elephants in real time, so every hour we can see exactly where the elephants are by using Save the Elephants tracking app. So what you're looking at on your screen now is what the, the screen looks like. So we can have this on an iPad or an iPhone, and it's really useful for wildlife managers to monitor the individual elephants and provide protected um, protection if needed. And so one of the algorithms on the tracking system using, uses movement rates and the ability to pick up streaking behavior. So streaking is when an elephant moves more than 2.5 kilometers an hour. And this is usually as a result of an elephant responding to a threat. So the algorithm can be really useful for monitoring when elephants go into risky areas or go into farmland. And this example is from an elephant called Wide Sital. So on your screen, you can see a map and the, the, the green line is the border of the national park, which is on the left, and then community land on the right. 
So Wai Satao, he left the National Park and was in this area, and it's actually a bit of a risky area. There's lots of illegal charcoal burning going on there um, <clears throat> and some farming there. And so we saw that he left and then he suddenly streaked. So you can see the red dotted line on your screen. And so he moved for 18 kilometers at over 2.5 kilometers an hour. So we were a bit worried. It was quite unusual um, to see this behavior. So then we went, we sent a team of rangers to see if Wai Tao was okay. And we found that he'd actually been shot um, with an arrow. And luckily we were able to get some vets in and we successfully treated Wai Tao's um, wound. So another algorithm that we use are geofences. So this is when the elephant crosses the virtual line and you can create a geofence um, around farmlands or again at risky areas. So in the map on your right, you can see a blue line and this is um, a geofence around our study site, which is all farmland. And so if an elephant crosses, we get a, a text message or an email alert and then we can send in rangers to chase the elephants away or in the case in the photo in the left, we had a gyrocop to try and push the elephants away from the community area. And we have hundreds of, kilo hundreds of kilometers of geofencing across the country, across farmlands and also unsafe territory. And from this data, we can also identify corridors of movement into farmlands. And we can also help define elephant rangeland. Collaring elephants can also help us identify human elephant conflict hotspots. And I'd like to end the presentation with a story about uh, this beautiful bull that you're looking at now called Manolo, who led us to understand and find out about a community who their everyday reality is elephants. And it's really um, a conflict community, which we didn't know about. So Manolo was collared in a beautiful location called Lake Jipe, which is in Savo West National Park and borders Tanzania. And so the reason we collared here is that there'd been reports of high levels of poaching, especially from the Tanzania side. And as a result, when we were there, we found that a lot of the elephant groups were orphans. So they'd been left without the matriarch. And so after a few weeks of being collared, Manolo started to show really interesting and quite routine behavior. So on the map on the left, you can see the lake in blue, and then the red lines are, um, are Manolo's movement tracks. So he has a fairly wide range of movements, but then when we zoom in, we can see that Manolo has quite a favorite spot. So we were seeing that he was spending the day in the lake edge, and then at night he was leaving the lake and going through community land, which is highlighted in pink. So we were quite, we, we're quite curious what was going on. Why was he going to the lake edge? What was attracting him to the lake edge? And why was he going through the community area? And so um, through ground and aerial monitoring, we found that the lake edge was actually filled with reed beds. And so the elephants would love to feed on these reeds for the whole day. They literally uh, spend like 12 hours of the day just munching on reeds. I suppose on a hot day as well when it's most days in Savo is very hot. It must be quite nice to be in the cool waters of the lake, surrounded by your food. And we often found um, Manolo with a group of other really big bull elephants. And we saw that the reed beds were actually taller on the community side. So the lake encompasses part of the national park and part of the community. And on the community side, those, these reeds were a lot taller, which is one of the reasons we uh, think that Manolo and these elephants are attracted to this area. But we started to worry about how close Manolo and these, his associates were to people. In this photo here, you can see how close people's houses are to the lake edge. And in the middle of the photo, there's a channel. And this is what people use to access the lake for fishing. And I don't know if you spotted him uh, or not, but Manolo, I'll circle him in red, is actually hidden in the reed beds. So you can imagine how easy it would be for a dinky boat to just knock right into Manolo. And so we found out that after feeding in the lake for the whole day, Manolo and his associates would walk through the community, literally meters past people, past uh, school, past shops, past houses. And so we started to speak to the community here and we found out that they had actually been 
quite a number of instances with the elephants here. So a number of people had been injured by elephants and in one really sad case, someone had been killed by the elephants. So this suddenly rang alarm bells for us as we were worried that this area was a ticking time bomb, that conflicts could escalate with more people being impacted by elephants and potentially elephants being killed in retaliation. So we then carried out a rapid rural appraisal to really understand what exactly was going on here. And so this study will help inform conservation management and planning. And we're hoping to go back to this area and uh, determine what different methods, what different tools we can use from, uh, from the toolbox to help this community. So with more innovation and with more empathy towards each other, we believe that we can make, move from a state of conflict to a state of coexistence. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I'd be really delighted to answer any questions that you may have. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen right now. Thanks, Lydia. Um, a fantastic, fantastic talk and great work. Um, uh, I, I'm always in awe of that uh, that app that, that you guys have with elephants all over the place. And the, it's just such such an amazing tool and the use that you, you put it to. Um, is is fascinating, and I do hope that there are things that we can learn that we can we can bring across to Asia as well, and um, and and all uh, all work together. And I think it's it, interesting that you were talking about a toolbox as well. Um, in that our last elephant professional talk was from Andy, was also talking about toolboxes and different things we can do. Um, my question, I'm going to open it up to other people's questions at the minute, in a minute, but um, my first question is with the elephant stinky repellent thing. Um, very interesting. Uh, how, how long has that been working? Have you, in the original trials, how long have they been, been going on for? Do the elephants become near to it and move or, are they, uh, or is it a long-term thing to already test it? Because we know the bees across on your side have worked for a very long time. Yeah, so it's, it's quite a new um, method. Um, I, it was probably 2017 which they started to trial it in Uganda. And it was actually, um, interestingly, it was a group of school kids that sort of came up with the idea. They had this competition um, in Uganda. And um, so then they started trialling it on, in a conflict hotspot. And, um, you know, the results were really Quite striking. I mean, those the the farmers' fields that had the smelly repellent um, were protected. And you can also um, you can also spray the, the the repellent onto the crops. But for Savo, we tried spraying it, but because we during the rains it just sort of washes all the repellent. But um, yeah, the the fences that we so we started trialing it in Savo last year, and it seems yeah, the, so far it's really uh, positive. But yeah, we're working with. Um, World Aid and the Ugandan Conservation Foundation on this and so we're trying to see you know if it it might be very effective in one area but not in another area and yeah but if anyone's interested um, in this method just please email me and we can connect you to the right people and share the recipe um, and what's good about it is that um, all the ingredients needed are quite cheap and it's easy for the communities to source um, and so we're hoping that eventually it becomes quite sustainable that even people start growing the chilies needed for it and so they can just grow the bits needed and then just uh, make it themselves and just refresh those bottles that are surrounding the fence but yeah we'll uh, we're keeping we're still keeping on it we're still trying it and um yeah we'll keep you updated on how that goes but it'll be interesting to see if it works in asia so if anyone Send me, it there. send me the recipe um, I, because I, 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 um, I presume it would be better if we could try it scientifically, but I'm sure it's something we could try here because as you know, yeah. the elephants spend time walking around the place and there are certain times we don't want them to go into certain areas. So yeah. maybe, maybe our gardeners at the hotel would be very, very happy if we could have, have some sort yeah. of repellent that keeps the elephants from actually munching on the, on the bits they're not supposed to munch on. So yes, please send me the recipe um, and we will trial it here and then hopefully we can persuade someone to try it on a scientific basis. And we, we have the contact, yeah. as you know, Josh, if you're out there. Um, and, if not, <laughs> and if not, we will um, we'll try it on a non-scientific basis. Yeah. Um, it, is really, it does really smell. So for the gardeners, they might be a, it a bit may not may not fit with the hotel. <laughs> stick it outside people's rooms. Anyway, let's, let, if, please send me the recipe. We'll have a look. 
Um, so, uh, Kun, ooh, if you're there, are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. Are there any questions from Facebook? Um, yes, from all of um, veterinarian, Dr. Nisa. The question is about the endopass that you use for the elephants. Like, how do the elephant know um, that it's safe for them to use? Or like, do they, um, you know, explore by themselves or anyone introduce to them? Yeah, so um, we actually collared some elephants before the railway was finished so that we could see um, ele how elephants adapted to the railway and how their movements would be impacted. And sort of at the beginning, um, when the, the railway line was finished, you know, a lot of the underpasses weren't being used that much. And I think that's because the elephants didn't really know where they were. But over time, we're seeing that eventually there's more use under the underpasses. So I think it's just, I mean, we're not, we're not showing them where it is. It's just elephants you know, working it out for themselves. We know they're very, very clever. So once they've used it once, they'll probably use it again and their scent that they leave will attract other elephants to use these underpasses. But yeah, it's just a shame because um, it's a very controversial issue in Savo, but um, you know, the railway line, it could have, you know, it was happening, but it could have been done a lot more environmentally friendly and it could have consulted a lot of the organizations there and I think it was just last minute when they decided to include researchers to come up with where to put the underpasses but yeah there, there needs to be more underpasses because finding is that a lot of the elephants are now as I was saying are stuck they haven't found they haven't found where the underpasses are so they're staying in communities and also, a lot of um, people are using it to livestock in the park. So there's heavy use by livestock. So that's putting the elephants off using it. Um, and now there's illegal settlements because when you have the underpass, you've got shade and shelter. So this is attracting legal human settlers here. So these are the sort of uh, big challenges that we're, we're dealing with. And it's, it gets more political because, yeah, I mean, it's moving people off. Um, areas but yeah the collar and the elephants have really helped us understand um, how elephants over time are reacting to these underpasses and to the train yeah I'm so sure they are very smart like smart enough to learn how to use this one or to solve the problems that why we still have to I mean try to find a way to help with human elephant conflict um, for the other questions, it's about the collars that we put on the elephant. Um, how long does the collar stay on the elephants? And, you know, um, did you find any poachers like also kill the elephant with the collars? Yes, yeah, so the, the collar, so I didn't explain before, so there's a unit on the top of the collar that sits on the neck and then holding that in place is a weight. So within the unit on the top of the collar, you have the battery and then the, there's VHF tracking and then the GPS um, unit. And so the battery lasts about three to four years. Um, and that's having, um, that's setting the collar to collect fixes every hour. And obviously you can fix, uh, you can change the data collection to every like 10 minutes if you want, but that will obviously use up um, a lot of the battery life. But we usually have the collars collecting data every hour and that lasts sort of three to four years. Um, in terms of poaching, um, yeah, tragically, we have had a few collared elephants um, poached and, um, you know, these poachers are getting very clever. It's not just your sort of, your, um, your very poor um, community member. It's, you know, it's, there's a lot of, um, technology used by the poachers. So in one incident, we actually, um, they were able to hide the transmitter of the elephants. So we didn't know that the elephant was poached because obviously we would have got a immobility alert and we would come to the area and then obviously we could catch the poach, but the poacher was very clever and actually hid the unit. So uh, yeah, having, getting over these challenges are very difficult, but the, the app itself where we can see the, um, the live movements of the elephants. That's only very select people that have that and it's very difficult to hack into that. So um, poachers aren't finding the elephants from the app. It's probably just, you know, um, they've opportunistically come across a collared elephant and yeah, known a bit about what a collar does. 
yeah, I hope that answers your question. There's a bit of a digression there, sorry. <laughs> Uh, I I don't have another question on from Facebook, but one question like for now, like since the COVID, I saw like news like even in Thailand or in Asia that a lot of um, wildlife have killed uh, people kill wildlife because of you know like economy and they still need more money. Is this um, COVID effect with the African elephant as well? Yeah, so we're starting to see. Um, a lot more um, like bushmeat hunting. Obviously, people are really worse off at the moment, you know, not being able to work. And so, yeah, there has been a, a trend of more bushmeat hunting. There's more snares being left out. Um, in terms of poaching elephants for ivory, we're not too sure yet. I suppose in the next few months, we'll be able to look at the trends. But yeah, it's a bit hard to say for that. But yeah, I mean, Kenya, a lot of it's, conservation economy is based on tourism, especially the conservancies. So it's, yeah, we are really being impacted by the lack of tourism. Um, but luckily there are, um, in some areas, there's, you know, funds in place, the ranger teams are still um, there, but we are seeing these slowly rising trends of bushmeat hunting and yeah, I will understand more about ivory soon. And of course, snares, if they're being put out, can be harmful to elephants in other ways as well, which is the, yeah. an increase in snaring is going to, going to hurt the elephants. Okay, well, that was um, going to be... One more. Go on, one go, more. go. <laughs> so one more question from Dr. Pichet um, to ask about your opinions and research. Like, like, are elephants respond differently based on human behaviours in landscape as well? Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's been... Um, different research especially in Kenya of, of uh, elephants reacting to people like one example um, in Amboseli they had the the clothing of um, so there's different tribes in Kenya so people and the different tribes they speak a different dialect and wear different clothing and some of uh, tribes are more uh, historically have been known to poach elephants more than others and so others are sort of uh, don't hunt elephants and they did a study in Amboseli to see how elephants would react to the putting out clothing of the different tribes and so the the tribe that historically has hunted elephants the elephants would run away from and then the other tribe that is more sort of uh, has more the coexisted with elephants the elephants didn't um, sort of run away from that smell so yeah I mean they're they're very clever indeed and they do respond significantly to, to humans. And we know that elephants, uh, when they're traveling through human settlements, they'll move a lot faster in, the, in these areas because they know it's a lot riskier. And they'll often move more at night if they're moving through human settlement. Obviously, uh, it's more difficult to be detected in the evening time. So yeah, I mean, they have a very good perception of risk. And so they do adapt uh, their behaviors uh, to risk. And with the, with the railway line, we were finding that a lot of the elephants were crossing under the railway line at night time. And this is in response to risk. They know it's, it will be safer to cross at night than in the daytime. And also they were going a lot faster when they were crossing underneath, um, obviously, because they, you know, they want to get under, they want to get across as soon as possible. So yeah, there's just a few examples uh, off the top of my head. There's many, many examples. And have you found them perhaps more aggressive or have people found them perhaps more aggressive in areas where some of the mitigation methods have been more aggressive and people have been using firecrackers or I saw you had one of your toolbox there was, was, was fire or fireworks. Um, because in Asia, we, we do seem to see where that elephants can be where in areas where people um, use these fear-based tactics to get to, to move the elephants along, they end up with elephants being more aggressive to people. Or is that because there's this history of, of perhaps hunting and poaching elephants, is that is that kind of uh, negated in, in Kenya? Yeah, I mean, we haven't, I, I, I wouldn't say it's made elephants um, more aggressive, I suppose. Well, with, with the bees as well, it's a, you know, it's a, a natural behavior. I mean, there's, they, they experience bees, um, in the wild, so they sort of used to them, um, so they're not necessarily um, becoming more aggressive from the bees. Um, 
so yeah, I, I think the elephants are generally so they're sort of in Sava as well. There's a lot of areas where you know historically there has been poachers. They're generally more aggressive than other populations. So Samburu, the elephants here are very very um, chilled out. You can get very close to them, and that's because they're sort of they're used to the researchers, and there hasn't been well historically as much conflict. I mean that is changing. There's more conflict happening now. But yeah, Savo, there's been this history of, um, of, of conflict. Um, but yeah, I mean, elephants as well, I mean, like with firecrackers, eventually they do become habituated. So we were using firecrackers in the Transmara, well, not me, the farmers, but uh, uh, after using it for a few months, they didn't even care. It was just like a bang and they, they didn't do anything. So yeah, you have to really, so I think coming up with any mitigation method, like it's about you know not just it's not relying on one method it's providing farmers with different methods and you know adapting um to elephants because i mean they are very clever and they'll work it out eventually i mean they can even go under electric fences or push trees onto the electric fences to get over it so yeah finding innovative ways is difficult sometimes <laughs> yeah and i guess you guys have have the luxury of, of a lot more space as well at lower human lower human density so um, and, and I'm just thinking elephants elephants know where they are as well I'm just I'm just remembering yeah. a drive from uh, Lewa to Loisaba <laughs> and on the conservancies all the elephants were relaxed and chill very much like the ones you have around Samburu but once you stepped off the conservancies um, the elephants they were they were not happy to see a vehicle they were not hanging around at all they would disappear so uh, all, yeah. all very fascinating as I say I'm just yeah thinking, extremely jealous i'm going to have to come and visit you as soon as <laughs> please please come and visit <laughs> um one question i think leo's disappeared leo my son who you may remember oh, from a long time yeah. ago had a question um when he was very small <laughs> exactly he, he wouldn't have had that question but um yes his his question was or his statement was um elephants love sunflower seeds be careful our elephants we use that for the target <laughs> training and positive reinforcement um so yeah, yeah um again we have a once they work yeah, out I mean, yeah, I mean, that's a very good question because, yeah, I mean, we used to work with Josh with the sunflowers. Yeah, yeah. And it would run down from the top of the hill to the research camp for sunflower seeds. Um, but I think, because uh, in its form, obviously, the sunflower, is, it'd be quite difficult to pick out the sunflower seeds. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I mean, obviously, we work with captive elephants in Thailand and that became you know a treat so uh, I don't think the, the, the wild elephants have maybe worked out that oh the seeds are a delicious snack but yeah so far they, 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 they will avoid the sunflowers they don't eat them I think it would be quite difficult to get them out <laughs> yeah okay well cool um if there's no other questions oh have you got anything no more <laughs> But oh. just one thing that I think you have to cook sunflower seeds before <laughs> the wild elephant love to eat it. <laughs> yeah. They like them because they've been fried in something nice. That's a good point. Yeah. Okay, perfect. There we go. Now we have our answer. Okay, so thank you very much, Lydia. Thank you for all, all of the great work and thank you for Save the Elephants, as I say, one of my favorite organizations in the world. Um, and I would love to come and I will come as soon as I possibly can to come and visit you yes, in Salva because I've do. never been. Um, and I know you told me off the other day for being jealous when you posted that photograph of an elephant walking through <laughs> the camp, but I'm still jealous. Um, <laughs> I, I, I love that area um, and I, I love wild elephants and um, especially relaxed wild elephants. So um, thank you very much for that. And as I said before, very, very, very happy to see that, you've, um, to, that you spent some time with us early in your career. And as I say, you've gone on to great things. Um, and thank you very, very much for coming and talking to us. Um, well, thank you very much. And all that remains for me to do is to say thank you to Anantara, our sponsors, who um, let me stay up here uh, in the Elephant Bar. And um, thank you very much. And for those of you who, uh, who have been worried about me, I am okay. As you can see, I am moving around the place and we should be getting back to live streams in a week or so's time. Uh, I've got a few things to, to have to get sorted out first before we'll be there. So thank you very much for all your concern, those of you who've done. Don't worry, I'm, I'm, I'm ticking over nicely. Um, and that's it. We will see you next week. I am lining up. We haven't actually got confirmation yet, but I am lining up another, should be another African, um, African based, if, I, if it all works out, uh, um, elephant professional live stream next week. Um, 
hopefully from Amboseli. We're trying to work it out, um, and I will uh, I will tell you more uh, as and when we get it. But we won't upstage you, Lydia. So that's cool. Uh, thank you very much. Um, enjoy the rest of your day, and thank you to everybody on um, on Facebook, and thank you to everybody here on Zoom. And we will see you very very soon. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye.